Jeremy is going to come up here and he's going to talk with us about Rent Name Coin. So I'm going to invite him up. And directly after this talk, he is going to have a workshop of his own, uh, which is probably going to take place in the workshop area where he's going to just demonstrate to you everything that he's going to be talking about. So go ahead and come on up. Let's go ahead and give him a hand. He's going to talk with us about Name Coin tour. Hand. Yeah. Hand. Okay. Okay. There we go. <laughs> And yeah, Jeremy, take it away. Let's see this good uh, location. Yeah. All right, I'm Jeremy from Namecoin. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, some adventures that uh, I had over the past year or so, uh, integrating uh, Namecoin into Tor browser and experimenting with all that cool stuff. So let's get started, shall we? So first off, a bit of a disclaimer, this is not a Tor project talk. Uh, I'm a Namecoin developer that is going to color my perspective to some extent. So uh, the perspective of the Tor developers might differ from mine, and that's totally OK. All right, so uh, as we probably all know here, uh, Onion services with Tor are really, really cool. Uh, they have encryption. They have authentication. They have censorship resistance. All this stuff is really awesome. And it doesn't even depend on a trusted third party like certificate authorities. It's just magically built in. So they're great. Unfortunately, the uh, UX has a problem. What is this problem, you ask? Well, this is the problem. Uh, addresses like this are basically impossible for humans to remember or even reliably recognize. And so as a result, humans do not actually check the entire address. Uh, and so this can cause things like phishing attacks. So for anyone who was not here at the intro to Namecoin talk yesterday, I will give a very brief intro. Uh, Namecoin is basically DNS, but on a blockchain. We use the .bit top-level domain. Uh, internally, the names are represented by special coins. You can think of them sort of like colored coins. Uh, we were the first project forked from Bitcoin all the way back in 2011. So the Namecoin developers recognized very early on that uh, using Namecoin as a naming layer for Onion services was a potentially very interesting use case. Uh, because this would provide global decentralized names, just like .onion, but they would also be human meaningful. For example, something like, I don't know, federalistpapers.bit could point to the Federalist Papers Onion service. And this would solve that UX issue. Uh, the first implementation of all this stuff was all the way back in July of 2011. Uh, it was NMC Socks by It's Not Lupus. Uh, and these experiments continued for quite a few years. Uh, we had some discussions with the Tor developers. There wasn't a huge amount of adoption that actually materialized. Uh, I gave a 34C3 talk on a lot of this background. Check it out if you're curious. Uh, but then we uh, started seeing some signs that there might be some increased interest. Uh, and uh, this happened because I happened to run into a Tor browser developer, uh, Arthur Edelstein, uh, in October of last year on Twitter. And this is and all, I, all that happened was I subscribed to an RSS feed of all the Twitter search results for Namecoin uh, to see what people are saying about us. And I happened to see this. Uh, not sure if you can read that. Uh, uh, so Arthur is saying, I'm interested in making Onion sites easier to use by making the domain names memorable. Different approaches have different properties, which I'm trying to explore. And he mentions Namecoin as a potentially uh, interesting approach. So I replied. I said, hi, I'm the Namecoin dev who prototyped Namecoin naming for Onion services. Definitely still interested. Would be cool to chat about moving forward. Now, the discussion that, uh, and that uh, got kicked off there was interesting and different from previous discussions. Because previously, the Tor people had mostly been interested in uh, helping users experiment with installing Namecoin into Tor browser themselves. Uh, this was the motivation of uh, the Proposal 279 pluggable naming API. But uh, this time, Arthur had a sort of different intended approach. Uh, he said, I think modularity is good, but I don't think waiting for the sands of time to pick a winner is the right approach. Instead, Tor Project should start implementing and deploying resolvers in Tor and Tor Browser, and then we can learn and iterate. So something that uh, initially surprised me um, when I started talking to the Tor people about this topic was that, uh, so the Tor people totally recognize that the non-meaningful names of Onion domains. They're a massive UX problem and a massive security problem. 
to the point that the Tor people are generally okay with compromising on the security model to fix it. And in particular, that means uh, that uh, making sure that the name owners stay anonymous is actually not really a requirement, at least short term. You know, I mean, they want to make sure we have a plan to deal with it eventually, but this was not something they were uh, uh, going to be strict about short term. The big thing they were going to be fairly strict about was uh, performance and scalability. Uh, so, uh, for example, Arthur gave sort of a recommended scenario for what he's, his requirements would be, would be that he would suggest, uh, which is the user installs a Tor browser uh, from scratch and they launch it, and then they immediately type a .bit domain into the address bar, and the delay in loading the website it shouldn't be noticeably more than what you would expect to get from a Dell Onion website, meaning that the random variation uh, in terms of just building a Tor circuit to the Onion service, that should be the dominant part of the delay. Sound difficult? Yeah. Uh, when he said that, uh, my initial thought was, okay, there is no way we're going to be able to pull that off. But, uh, you know, what I, I didn't say that. What I said was, okay, that's going to be really hard, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of optimizations we could be doing that we're not doing right now. Uh, so, you know, let me do some experiments. Uh, we'll see what we can pull off. Uh, and, you know, just as a general rule, if, um, when you're a software developer, don't tell people on the spot that something is going to be impossible. At least, at least uh, you know, do a little bit of basic research before you say that. So uh, during this time, uh, Ahmed Badiwala and I were being funded by NLNet and Cyphers to port uh, Electrum, the lightweight Bitcoin wallet, to Namecoin. Uh, and that port was, oh, was very, very recent when Arthur and I first started talking about this uh, uh, tour stuff. And, uh, but despite the fact that Electrum NMC was very, very immature and embryonic at that time, uh, after talking to Arthur, it became really clear that, uh, that that code base was going to be our best bet for achieving the performance needs that Arthur outlined. Uh, so NLNet had actually allocated a bunch of funding for us to uh, spend on a different lightweight client, which was called Consensus J Namecoin. And uh, based on talking to Arthur, it looked like that was going to be a dead end for us uh, because that design was going to have a five-minute initial sync and there was no way we could really optimize that anymore. So, uh, happily, NLNet is totally okay with letting us uh, divert funding from one set of deliverables to another. Uh, so we decided to divert that funding from Consensus J Namecoin to focus on getting Electrum NMC to the point where Tor might be able to use it. So uh, kudos to NLNet for actually giving us that flexibility. It's super cool. All right, so what were we starting with in October of 2018 before we, uh, before we did optimizations for this? Well, the initial setup downloaded 672 megabytes, uh, which took around six minutes on my Talos 2 workstation, which is a very fast CPU, and that was without Tor. So, uh, and all that had to be done before you could do any name lookups. So, we were a very far way from actually meeting the performance goal that Arthur outlined. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with how Electrum uh, for Bitcoin encodes uh, checkpoints, uh, basically, it's a list of every 2016th block hash. And Electrum only downloads the headers uh, for the uh, blockchain that are after the final checkpoint hash uh, that it has. And this is useful because uh, if you um, uh, it, usually you create a wallet uh, that, uh, that, that is created after the final checkpoint. So this way it doesn't need to download any block headers uh, that, are, uh, that are before um, the checkpoint. And those aren't going to be needed anyway because they're not going to cover your wallet. Um, but if you do just, if you do need to validate a transaction that's uh, before the last checkpoint hash, then Electrum will just download uh, all 2016 block headers between the two checkpoint hashes that uh, surround it, and then it will uh, validate the transaction using SPV. But this doesn't work great for Namecoin, and here's why. Uh, unexpired names can be anywhere in the last 36 kiloblocks, which means uh, even if a wallet was created after the final checkpoint, uh, there might be names that were last updated before the final checkpoint unless we make the checkpoint uh, 36 kiloblocks ago. Uh, so, you know, we, that means we can't really set a checkpoint more recent than that. But if we do set a checkpoint that's 36 kiloblocks ago, that already drops the sync up download uh, to 66 megabytes. So that's already uh, about tenfold improvement. So that's a good start, right? Okay, how can we do better than that? So what if we did set a checkpoint that's more recent than 36 kiloblocks? 
Uh, this does drop the initial sync up download to 4.9 megs. Not bad. But uh, that means if you look up a name uh, whose header you haven't downloaded yet, uh, that means you have to download 2016 uh, headers. Uh, and that's 3.2 megabytes. And that's during the name lookup. So that's going to be a lot of extra latency for name lookups, which is going to be a massive uh, performance problem. But can we actually improve that? The answer is yes. Uh, so the Namecoin block headers, if you're not familiar with how merged winding works, there's actually two parts of a Namecoin block header. Uh, there's a Bitcoin style block header, which is 80 bytes. All the fields are the same as in Bitcoin. There's also a merged mining header. This is variable length, but it's a lot bigger. 10 kilobytes is not unusual. And you need both of those parts to verify the proof of work. But the trick is, if you have some other method to verify that the proof of work in a header is correct, you don't actually need the merged mining header. Uh, and guess what? A checkpoint is a perfectly valid way to do that. If, uh, if, a, if a block header is, is committed to by a checkpoint, you can be pretty sure that the proof of work is valid for that block header. So since a checkpoint can verify a block header without needing the merged mining header, that means we don't even have to download the merged mining header. So uh, I patched the uh, protocol so that uh, it doesn't send the uh, merged mining headers for uh, block heights that are before uh, the last checkpoint. And that drops the size of the on-demand set of 2016 headers from 3.2 megabytes to 323 kilobytes. Cool, another tenfold improvement. So uh, that's useful, but you know, 323K is still kind of big if, if you're downloading it over Tor when you do a, a DNS lookup. Uh, so can we do better than that? Hmm, let's see. Well, so the Electrum protocol actually has a, an additional checkpoint format, which uses uh, Merkle proofs. So the idea is that uh, the client ships with a Merkle root of all the headers prior to the uh, last checkpoint height. And then when the client asks the server, hey, I want to see this block cha blockchain header, uh, the server provides a Merkle branch proof when that header is requested. So you can download a single header at a time. You don't need to download an entire chunk of 2016 headers. And you, it still connects to the checkpoint via that Merkle proof. And Merk, if, you're not if you're not familiar with Merkle branch proofs, the great thing about them is they are logarithmic in size. So this scales awesome. Uh, now, sadly, I had to port this feature from Electron Cache to Electrum uh, because uh, the only implementation was in Electron Cache. That's the BCH fork of Electrum. Uh, so I had to port that to Electrum and then merge it to Electrum MC. But uh, that actually worked. Uh, and so now, instead of 323 kilobytes uh, to get a uh, block header for the SPV proof, now it's only under 2 kilobytes. So yeah, that's more like it. Great, that, we can do that with Tor. Uh, so, uh, but what about the uh, headers that are after the final checkpoint? These are things that are basically the headers that were uh, mined after, uh, the, uh, after the software was released. So uh, Electrum normally only downloads headers from one server at a time. Uh, well, that's pretty easy to optimize. So I patched it to download them from multiple servers in parallel. Not bad. That actually makes it sync a lot faster. Uh, so Arthur also had some op opinions about uh, the uh, impact on the uh, final binary size uh, for the Tor browser download. And he said Tor browser is on the order of 60 to 80 megabytes. Uh, so adding a few megabytes is probably acceptable. But adding 10 megabytes is probably going to be too much. Uh, the problem is all of the components of Namecoin's Tor Browser integration that we had put together, crap, that's 39.7 megabytes. Uh, okay, we're going to have to optimize that a lot. So the first thing that I did to optimize that was uh, just making a bunch of unneeded features uh, toggleable at build time. So Electrum NMC has a QT GUI. Uh, we don't need that for Tor Browser. Uh, there are plugins for hardware wallets. Again, Tor Browser doesn't care about that. Uh, payment protocol things, which uh, is mostly used for talking to BitPay. Uh, Electrum NMC is not going to need that with Tor Browser. Uh, lots of wallet-related things for like like uh, signing transactions. We don't need that for Tor Browser. In addition, our Go-related code bases, uh, specifically NCDNS and DNS Prop 279, they had a bunch of TLS and DNS-related code, including things like TLS support for Chromium, which, yeah, uh, Tor Browser does not care about uh, Chromium. So all that stuff is now optional at build time, and so we can just strip that out. Uh, also, uh, the uh, 
so if you're not familiar with Go, uh, Go binaries are always statically linked, and uh, the Go runtime is really huge. So we had two different uh, Go executables, ncdns and DNS prop 279 uh, and sadly that meant a lot of stuff was getting duplicated in between those two binaries. So there were valid reasons to have them as two binaries originally, but uh, combining them into one single specialized tool uh, helped us avoid that static library redundancy, so that helped a lot. In addition, uh, so we were using uh, the project uh, TorNS by Mija uh, as a dependency, and, and that uses TXTorCon, which is a library that talks to the Tor control port. Uh, and, uh, you know, that makes sense, because Mija develops TXTorCon. Obviously, he'll use his library. Uh, but sadly, TXTorCon is very big. Its dependencies are big. And so I ended up refactoring TorNS to use STEM, which is a different uh, control port library, instead of TXTorCon. Uh, STEM has no additional dependencies. It's generally smaller, uh, so that helped a lot. And on that note, huge kudos to Jesse Victors of Onion Name System for some example code that was very helpful for that purpose. So how did we do on uh, reducing the binary size? Well, all that stuff got it down to 3.3 megs from the original 39.7 megs. So yeah, that, that's still kind of significant, but it's no longer a deal breaker. That, that meets the requirement that Arthur speculated would be uh, required. All right, so uh, once we actually had those performance goals met, uh, you know, then, then we actually had to demo it for all the other Tor developers and, uh, you know, get, get some uh, additional uh, approval. So uh, we scheduled a demo, uh, and that was on uh, April 26th of this year. Uh, Georg Koppen, who was the lead uh, Tor browser developer at the time, uh, was there. And, uh, you know, as you would expect, they were cautious, but uh, also optimistic, which was great. Um, and by the way, I want to go on a quick tangent here. Tor has an excellent review culture. Um, at, w at one point, while I was sort of outlining uh, what, what we were proposing, um, I was asked, assuming you'd have to argue against including Namecoin support in Tor Browser, which arguments would you bring up? And I, I think this is a really good uh, way to frame uh, uh, that kind of question, because it helps get, get developers to... Uh, to, p to keep track of, um, you know, what are the downsides and trade-offs of their proposals without making it some kind of, like, adversarial thing. So I, I wish more Floss projects would ask that kind of question in, th in that way. So kudos to Tor for uh, having an awesome review culture there. Um, now, even though they were optimistic, um, still, everyone involved agreed this is... This is an experiment. It's not something that we are, you know, shipping to end users immediately or, ne or even necessarily at all. And so as a result, the scope had to be extremely narrow. Uh, so in particular, that meant uh, .bit domains will not point to IP addresses. They will only point to Onion services. Uh, there's no TLS. Uh, we're not going to do anything except the nightly builds. Uh, so it's not going to be in stable or alpha, at least for now. It's only going to be in the uh, GNU Linux uh, version, and it'll be disabled by default. So you need to use an environment variable to turn it on, at least for now. Uh, and the reason we wanted this scope to be very limited is, among other things, this limits the risk uh, to end users uh, from introducing a bunch of new code. And because that risk is limited, that means we can facilitate much faster review. Uh, and, you know, if the experiment goes well, then we can always expand the scope later. So, like, all five of the uh, scope limitations I described, they could all be lifted later, assuming the experiment goes well. If it doesn't go well, then that's that. Uh, and, you know, and in addition, um, uh, you know, introducing all this extra code into the Tor browser uh, build system, that does produce extra overhead uh, for the Tor developers. And so uh, limiting the scope limits, also limits the, the, uh, the impact it has on, on their workflow for just managing the, their code base. And that way, you know, if, given that they're not committing to keep the code there forever, uh, if they, um, you know, if, if they want to get rid of it later, they can strip it out pretty easily without much trouble. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, anonymity for name owners was not going to be a short-term requirement. But we did care about uh, anonymity for people who are viewing the websites, because this actually is a critical feature uh, in Tor Browser, users getting anonymity. So a really important sub-feature of that is something called stream isolation, which is uh, it's a feature in Tor that's not very well known, but it's super important. Basically, it isolates traffic from different user activities on different Tor circuits. So this is what makes users anonymous in Tor rather than pseudonymous. 
Uh, and unfortunately, uh, pretty much all of the uh, uh, pieces of code involved in uh, the Namecoin integration needed some patching to support stream isolation properly. Um, and, and yeah, this took probably two or three months of just me patching things to make that all work. Uh, there was a side benefit, though, because if you combine stream isolation and the parallelized blockchain download I mentioned for Electrum and MC, uh, it means you can uh, download headers over multiple Tor circuits at once. So even if you get a single bad Tor circuit that's really slow, uh, it won't bottleneck your blockchain download anymore. So that's a huge benefit. Um, in addition to the Namecoin-related software that needed patches, I also needed to patch the Tor daemon and Firefox uh, to actually ensure that stream isolation worked properly with Namecoin. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that, w that was probably one of the most involved areas of this whole effort, to be honest. Okay, so what remained uh, to actually get this in? Uh, lots of code cleanup. Um, uh, I did an in-person meeting uh, at the uh, Tor meeting in Stockholm in July of 2019. Uh, Integrated it into Tor Browser's build system, including reproducible builds. That was honestly fairly painless. Uh, Tor Browser has a great uh, reproducible build system. Um, so this was finally handed off to the Tor developers for review on November 11th. Uh, and after lots and lots of review cycles uh, and me having to address each piece of review, which I did, um, uh, it finally got merged to Tor Browser Nightly on December 18th. And uh, the first Tor Browser nightly binaries, officially from Tor, that uh, have the optional Namecoin support uh, in there, were uh, published on December 20th. So, uh, this, as, as you might have gathered, this is very recent. Uh, this stuff is hot off the press. So, if you want to try it out, uh, you can download the latest Tor Browser nightly for uh, GNU Linux from the Tor website. Uh, and run it with the environment variable Tor enable Namecoin equals 1. And uh, then Namecoin will be used to resolve uh, .bit as well as .bit.onion addresses. Uh, you might be wondering why both of those suffixes. Uh, they're the same thing right now. In the future, .bit might also point to IP addresses. .bit.onion will always be only onion. Uh, so if you want to try some example domain names, just, just to test it out, uh, these are some uh, domain names you can try. There's uh, Federalist Papers, Onion Share, Rise Up, and the uh, submission systems for the Intercept and WikiLeaks. Uh, and all of these uh, domains are owned by uh, friendly Namecoin supporters right now. Uh, they're happy to donate them to the uh, rightful owners. Um, but since they've not been donated to the rightful owners yet, you should not rely on these for your security. So please don't submit something to WikiLeaks using this URL right now. Um, I make no guarantee that that would be safe. So what's next? Uh, we want to support Windows and Mac OS. Um, shouldn't be too hard. Will require some refactors. Uh, although building Python for Windows reproducibly is going to be a fascinatingly fun adventure. Uh, we want to support Android. Uh, that's going to be a giant rabbit hole. Uh, who knows what's there? Uh, we think we can improve the uh, performance even more. Uh, we can cut the latency in half, cut the bandwidth in half, uh, and cut the binary size a lot by uh, using some fun tricks from uh, the uh, Go Busy Box project that uh, Uroot has created. Uh, we want to have a nice, friendly uh, GUI for uh, registering uh, domain names that are configured for Tor. So you, the user selects Tor from a drop-down menu, enters their .onion domain. They don't need to construct JSON manually. We want to have anonymity for name owners. Uh, even though Tor doesn't require this from a short term, uh, everyone involved wants it to happen. Uh, so this will be via integration with Monero and with BISC. Uh, check out my 34C3 talk for details on how that that's going to work. Uh, we want to support IP addresses, not just Onion services, as well as uh, we want to support TLS. Uh, we want to support uh, operating systems like Hunix and Tails. Uh, these are currently broken because of the control port filtering those OSs do. Should be fairly straightforward to fix that. Uh, we want to have some uh, better blockchain validation than what Electrum currently does. Uh, in particular, we, we would like to verify the ECDSA signatures on the name transactions, so not just the proof of work. Uh, we also want to support authenticated non-existence proofs. Um, there's, some, there's some research in the field happening now that uh, might yield something useful there. Maybe even find a way to use full nodes with Tor Browser. Not totally out of the question, but it'll be hard. Uh, and of most importantly, we want feedback from the Tor community because we don't know yet what Tor's criteria are going to be for advancing from lightly to alpha or stable or enabling it by default. 
and, you know, the tour devs might want something that's not on that to-do list I just gave. They may not want something that is on that list. And uh, we will honor whatever the tour people say, because it's their browser, not ours. So if you want to try this out yourself, uh, I'm hosting a workshop uh, in the uh, Critical Decentralization Cluster workshop area. Uh, it's right after this talk. Uh, bring a GNU Linux machine. You can use either a VM or bare metal. And please tell me what you think. This whole thing is an experiment. Uh, it's not a good experiment if, you, if we don't get good feedback. So please give feedback. Um, I want to thank our funders for uh, actually making this happen. Uh, NLNet Foundation, uh, Netherlands Ministry of Economic Affairs, and Cyphers. This work would not have gotten done without the funding from uh, those entities. So a huge thank you to our funders. Here's my contact info. Uh, Feel free to find me anywhere at the Congress as well. Uh, I'll be here um, uh, through the end of the Congress. Uh, I've got a big Namecoin logo on my shirt. It should be really easy to find me. Uh, so uh, thank you. Do we have, do we have time? Yeah. Do we have time, time, time for questions? Uh, okay, do we have time for uh, questions? Let's see. Um, are, 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 we, are, you, are we giving out mics for the questions? Okay, great. What's, what's required to run a server compatible with this? And in particular, like what's sent on the host header? Um, good question. So uh, all of the uh, redirection that's done from the dot .bit to the dot .onion that's basically done uh, uh, on the uh, basically on the transport layer. So the so the application layer, in particular, things like the host header as well as uh, a TLS SNI header. If you're using TLS, all of those will have the .bit domain. They will not have the .onion domain. Um, so if if you're running an Onion service and you want to make sure that it works properly with Namecoin, you'll need to make sure that it responds with the correct site if the host header is the .bit domain. Now, for what it's worth, in my experience. Experience, almost all of the Onion services I've seen, they respond with the correct Onion service regardless of what host header you send. Probably because no one is expecting uh, to see a different host header, so they're not bothering to check it. The only Onion service I've actually seen that doesn't behave that way is, is the DuckDuckGo Onion service. All the others I've seen uh, will serve the same thing for anything. Um, I, I couldn't catch that. Um, if, if, Yeah, you're correct. It's, it, it, it is a good idea to to, uh, to to configure them not to respond to anything. You're right, um, but no one does that in practice. Do we have other questions? All right. Looks like no additional questions. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, unless Diego has questions. Do you want to ask a question, Diego? Yes. yes. Jeremy, how did you get to be so awesome and working on Namecoin, and how does somebody contribute to Namecoin and be as awesome as you? Um, I can't comment on the being as awesome as me thing, um, but in terms of if anyone wants to contribute to Namecoin and get involved in this kind of stuff, um, you can uh, talk to us on our uh, IRC channel. It's uh, Namecoin-dev on Freenode. Um, it's also uh, mirrored to a Matrix channel, if you like Matrix. Um, you can also email me. Uh, my email address is up there. Um, you can also uh, find me at the Congress and talk to me. Um, or, for that matter, uh, you can post on Reddit. Uh, our subreddit is r slash Namecoin. We also have a uh, PHPBB forum if you're kind of super old school and like to talk to us that way. There's lots of ways to reach us, uh, and we would love to have uh, more uh, developers involved. Uh, we, we, we would love to work with more people. So, yeah, uh, we're a very friendly community. We love, uh, we love newcomers. So, yeah, uh, feel free to uh, talk to us if you'd like to collaborate. All right, thanks very much, Jeremy. Let's give him another round of applause.